On December 1, 2021, a furious minority group disrupted parliamentary proceedings after the first deputy speaker of parliament, Joseph Osewu, she retorted that he wasn't the speaker of parliament. His pronouncement angered the minority, which led to another commotion. For the second time in the year 2021, parliament was in total disarray. Now came the ultimate of the chaos ever witnessed by the Ghanaian parliament. So this is parliament, members of parliament, of course in a fisticuff with each other. Chaos in the chamber at the moment. There is large chaos. You could see the MPs. This time, the fight and acrimony had reached a crescendo. The MPs were physically at each other's throats, shoving one another and punching the faces of others. Three major disturbing scenes characterized the first year of the Eighth Parliament. But how did we get here? In this documentary, I explore the conduct of the MPs in the Eighth Parliament to establish the benefits or dangers of having a hanged parliament. The absence of the speaker would always require that either the first deputy speaker or the second deputy speaker takes the chair. Per the interpretation of the majority understanding others, this would mean that whoever chairs the proceedings, apart from the speaker, has the right to vote. The NDC, however, disagrees. Dr. Rashid Draman of the African Center of Parliamentary Affairs believes the standing orders must be reviewed to address the challenges posing danger to the country's democracy. Sharing the leadership of the committees. I mean, given what is happening now, uh, I don't know whether anybody can convince, uh, particularly the majority side, to give up, uh, you know, the leadership of certain committees. No, I'm just being, being realistic about this. Uh, and given what is happening, I don't also know whether the, the minority side if they are making certain demands those demands would be seen as genuine demands or demands that are supposed to position them in a way to to try to uh, take advantage of i mean the numbers that they have uh, to get the agenda um, go through at every stage on the part of the majority leader Oseche Mensa Bonsu amending the standing orders to elect seven MPs as speakers could cure the challenges faced by this hung parliament. The US is a flagship of presidential systems. Their speakers have votes. In the Senate, the vice president is there. He has a vote in most of the jurisdictions. In fact, what we have in our constitution holds that the, even those speakers, they, they say of them that when they preside, they don't have original vote, but they still have their casting vote. In Canada, there is an arrangement for them. They appreciate it, that they don't even lose their original vote. So what they do is, when the speaker is presiding, at the time he's presiding, he will not cast, if he has to exercise his original vote, one of the deputy speakers would exercise his original vote. Then he invite him to come and preside. Then he goes to plenary to exercise his original vote. In most cases, though, in most jurisdictions, the original votes are not exercised. They exercise their casting votes when there's a tie. I don't know of any speaker who is a member of parliament who doesn't have, who loses both votes. That is the, the original and the casting. In committee, right. the chair has a casting vote. So if he's a member of parliament, he could have a casting vote. And then that's, a, well, that's another thing that we can look at. As, uh, as, uh, as. And I, I want to believe that the framers of our constitution, you know, we practice all this, have a reason for this arrangement. They thought that to get an independent arbiter would be more useful. And that's why maybe the framers of, of our constitution thought that we should have the speaker away from the membership so that you can have the speaker at least as much as possible. I mean, the speaker is a human being, it's a political animal, 
you come from a party, I mean, but most of the time, the person will stay in the middle. You try and get on there, few occasions, maybe the person will, will tilt, but largely. But if the person is a member of parliament, especially in the kind of hang one that we have, in my view, it will be as a bit the situation. Because then, he will have a custom vote, as you are saying. Yes, so that, that settles the issue of whether speaker can vote or not. And therefore, maybe, if by implication, then the constitution changes, then the, the deputy speakers will equally have a, a, a custom vote. Another way we can do it is that we can come back and explicitly change the position of the constitution and stand over there to say that, look, yes, the speaker can remain a non-member of parliament, but any time the deputies are there, they should have a casting vote, just as we have in the committee, where the chairman doesn't have a vote, but when it ties, then he comes in with a, with a, with a, with a casting, uh, casting vote. Parliament appears to have treated the misconduct of MPs lightly. Although the leadership of the House have openly condemned the actions of the MPs, none of the MPs captured engaging in the brawl have been punished. Several society organization groups like Occupy Ghana have lamented over Parliament's inability to sanction rogue MPs. The majority leader admits Parliament has failed in this regard, but however blame the situation on some provisions in the standing orders. And I remember vividly in 19, was it 1998 or so, when we first came to Parliament, the Honorable Papa Ushiankuma was the first person who was cited and somebody said he had used unparliamentary language for the speaker at the time, Justice Annan, and said his conduct should be referred to the Privileges Committee. He got to be referred to the Privileges Committee, but nothing happened. Why? Because the NDC realized at the time that they didn't have two thirds, even though their number was 133 against our 67. They needed one to have sanctioned Papu Uziangkuma. If they had one, three, four, they would have sanctioned Papu Uziangkuma. They didn't have. And none of us was going to join them at the time. <laughs> so they dropped the matter. I'm just saying that because of the provisions in the standing orders, maybe you have to interrogate same and uh, have a second look at it to see whether the two-thirds majority. We don't want to create a situation where one side, for instance, our 169 at the time, we had a clear majority. Then you use it to ride roughshod over the dead minority. You don't want any such situation, which is why the bar was raised to two thirds. But that also is preventing us from sanctioning wrongdoing. So I don't know, maybe we need to interrogate the matter further. The executive president as a mandate of the people to govern. And he would need the support of parliament to be able to govern. And so let's do it in such a way that the support will be there. The support will be there after parliament has critically reviewed everything that the executive has sent to it in a manner devoid of partisanship, in a manner that shows fairness, in a manner that shows um, uh, th that shows rigor in scrutinizing whatever is sent um, to them. If this is done, at the end of the day, the executive may not be happy that um, its policies are being scrutinized like that because it may not be used to it. But at the end of the day, if you have a policy that is rigorously scrutinized before approved, then the output will be such that it will be beneficial to Ghanaians and if the output become beneficial to Ghanaians who take the credit. It's not a minority group. It's the majority group and it's the executive president. Professor Jampo is clear that government needs the support of parliament to operate. And this can only be achieved when consensus is reached among the two. From happenings in the chamber, it's clear that negotiations have broken down. And the president, I mean, every now and then is calling so on this, what is happening? Uh, what are you discussing with your colleagues in Parliament and so on? I'll be reporting to him. So he was he was asking that um, how can we have a situation reverting back to what we used to do when uh, you're able to bring the the leaders for us to dialogue on the way forward. 
And I said to him that, Mr. President, he should, that he should give me some time to work on my colleagues, have some consultations with them, and then we can agree. I don't want to just say that, oh, the President wants to see you. That's, that's not how it goes. Before you do that, you should have some consultations with them. And perhaps, maybe not one week, two weeks, some, maybe over some time. And I'm hoping that into this new year, we'll be able to discard a lot of the malfeasance that we engaged in uh, last year. Munta Kamubak, who agrees to the president's invitation, has some reservations. He wants every meeting with the president made official, arguing that the government cannot be trusted. I have so much respect for the president and the president knows it. He has never called us and we didn't go. But if the president calls us this time, we will not be there. Unless we agree that there will be somebody there to take minutes and make it official. And I know the president, sometimes when we meet him, we all say we are talking off record. We are talking off record. We are talking off record. So in an off record meeting, no. Because we can't trust you anymore. We can't. And we are vowed. We are not going to go into any unofficial meeting with them. Any meeting we have to have with them, it has to be official. Where the minute, we'll go through the minute and agree that this is the thing that we've agreed. And then we, 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 we leave. I'm sorry. I, I know that, I mean, uh, even our party leaders have insisted that because of the stature of the president, they are not looking at the individual, they are looking at the office. Anytime he calls, we must go. If the president calls us, we will insist that there will be somebody to take minutes. If that one will happen, we will go. But if there will be nobody to take minutes, we will not be there. Because we will not go into any of the There are, however, claims that President Akufuado reached out to former President John Mahama through his cousin, Gabi Asairochi Dakom, over the controversial e levy. Professor Jampo believes some of these engagements are healthy to ensure the effective running of government business. He, however, observed that Parliament can exist for four years without working, citing Malawi as an example. I know that it's been difficult for Akufuado to relate to John Mahama because up to now, John Mahama has not openly considered defeat of the 2020 elections. And of course, if I'm the um, executive president and you have not considered defeat, it becomes difficult to relate. But I tell you that Gabi Asayo Ochedako cannot go to John Mahama to negotiate or to talk and to dialogue with him without the tacit or open blessing of Nana. No, if he doesn't want it, there's no way Gabi can go do it. And for, so for me, that should be the beginning of a certain sincere dialogue that we need to get parliament to work. Otherwise, let's go the Malarian way. One time in the history of Malarian politics, their parliament existed for four years without working because it was a hung parliament and none of them wanted to quote and unquote play ball. None of them wanted to dialogue. They all wanted to flex muzzle. And so parliament became a standstill. If that is what we want, we should go ahead. But can Ghana's parliament hold operations for four years? The answer from many individuals is no, but the two groups in parliament continue to hurt themselves and further worsen the trust relation that exists between them. It's obvious the NDC and the NPP caucus is not enthused about the series of melee in the chamber. Munta Kamubarak is appealing for mediation from all quarters to help parliament cease fire and execute its mandate as required by law. I can bet you. You talk and you are doing so many things, and they walk away and they don't they even forget. They don't even come back to you. Until there's another difficult thing. I said, No, you cannot be treating her that way. We are not tools. I get it. You are not just instrument. Uh -huh. You get used when you have difficulty, and when they are difficult, then you forget about it. I get it. You can't do that. So I believe that both sides need a lot of reflection, sober reflection. Is there anybody that can mediate? I don't know. And if there are people who are interested in mediating, because believe me, if we are going to apply, because the standard order is instructed to favor majoritarian thing. I get it. But in it, there are a lot of things that you can use to make life uncomfortable for the majority. I get it. 
It's not being used because uh, it's not worth it. I mean, they are 169, they are one owner. Even if 30 of them were not, are not around. But you know, people can force it, people will travel, people. So you want to always exploit it. Oseche means Bonsu, who is assuring that never again would parliament be seen engaged in a free for all fight has begun moves to engage extended leadership on how to deal with the current situation. You know, growing up in, in, in uh, elementary schools and secondary schools, you did well, your teacher will mark and say to you that there is room for improvement. So I think that there should be room for improvement. There should be room to deepen consensus building. There should be room to bring in uh, many more people into the basket of consultations and collaboration. Many that, more people, who are you referring to in this case? I'm talking about when we talk to the leadership. Often I deal with the, the uh, majority leader. And sometimes he will tell me that, okay, on this matter, can you talk to the chief for the minority? And maybe I'll call him and have a discussion with him. But it's not for me to be dealing with the mi minority chief. Why? Because if you continue to do that, you'll be undermining the authority of the minority leader himself. Director of Public Affairs of Parliament observed that Parliament as an institution is unhappy with the latest developments and measures have been put in place to ensure a good working relationship in the chamber. What I know is that there have been times when they disagree. And when they've disagreed, they've all made their points known to each other that I'm going, even sometimes before we go to plenary, they would say that, look, I'm going to disagree with you on this. And they try to work on it before they, they go. And, and uh, once they go, if they're not able to build consensus, they come back to the drawing table. I mean, think about it. These things have been happening, but these are people who remain close allies. And so, yes, they do, they do have disagreements. But acrimony is not a word I will use. No, not at all. But for you, the hand father, is this stressing you making a job before? Um, I've got more grace than I think my <laughs> my 70 year old sister. So whatever you see on my head now is dying. Because my entire head is grey. I have been more stressed this past year than I have been in my entire adult life. In the last one year, Parliament has failed to demonstrate maturity and candor. Physical attacks, shoving and punching each other has no place in any democracy. But Ghanaians have had their fair share of the massive Miss Canada MPs due to the nature of this hung parliament. In spite of all the negatives associated with the House in its first year, Dr. Rashid Draman and Professor Jampo argues it's a blessing for the country's democracy. Uh, I think in, in many respects it's a, it's a blessing and I would like to see more hung parliaments in this country. Uh, provided we learn, that is both sides, learn to live with the, the new reality. Uh, if they do learn to live with the new reality, because they are still operating as if, uh, you know, we are in the seventh parliament or we are in the 6th parliament when the NDC had its uh, clear majority, the 7th parliament when the MPP had its clear majority. Yeah, hang, hang parliament all over the world can be blessings, they can be curses. Okay, so in our part of the world, depending on how we handle it, it can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse if you don't handle it well. So far, as a political science, scientist, to the extent that uh, the executive arm of government is aware that uh, there is another arm of government that is now serving as a countervailing authority to its powers, to the extent that the executive arm of, arm of government is beginning to be aware of this, for me, it's a blessing. But the majority leader disagrees. He believes the nature of this parliament has emboldened the minority to misbehave. I'll tell you something. In 2013, when we took our case to Parliament, uh, to the Supreme Court, and we, we thought that we had uh, won the... We had won... Um, 
power. At the time we had fewer seats in Parliament. We had fewer seats in Parliament. And we but we thought the president had won. I wanted that. I was praying for the courts to rule for uh, Ekufuado. I was praying for the courts to rule for Ekufuado because I thought if we had that situation with the president not having uh, his own party dominate parliament, that would require greater consultation from the president. And I thought that would help us to grow our democracy in a very unique way. So I was praying that then, because we had fewer seats, I was going to then continue as or whoever took over from me was going to continue as the minority leader. So we have a leader of government business whose sides will be uh, will, ha will have fewer seats in parliament. So the president, if he wants to do business, will have to be very consultative in whatever step that he took. I wanted that. And I was craving for that. Am I happy with what I'm seeing today? No. Because I thought that if we came to the table with very clear understanding of the rules of engagement, then we could grow parliament together. But if it has to be brain against brawn, that is a difficulty. So assuming, I get the impression that if the minority caucus now had 138 and we had 137, it was going to be difficult for any business of government to pass through. Look at what is happening to the budget. When they just came and said, oh, we've, we've rejected it. Right? What was, what was going to happen? Our democracy is about Mediterranean. If you want us to hold hand in hand, to go together, that's when this negotiation is necessary. But if it is about you going alone, after that one, we don't need to waste each other's time. Go map your strategy. Let me go map my strategy. And let's meet on the highway. And let's see how high the highway, how fast the highway can go. But if you acknowledge that the environment and the circumstances that you find yourself demands that you do give and take, then remember we are leading a group. The only way I can be able to carry my flock together is to show something that, oh, one more one, we have to give in this to take this. We took this and we have to give in this. But if this is about, oh, I'm majority, so you have your say and let me have my way. I said, okay, let's see how that happens. But Ransford Jampo and Dr. Rashid Draman have a caution for the NDC minority. They have to remember that, you know, uh, they hold the key to running this country. And at the end of the day, people are going to um, uh, conduct a referendum on them when we go to the polls. On the other side, the NDC um, is uh, supposed to be an alternative government, a government in waiting. And people have to see them in a, in a very credible and positive light. So um, if they don't also adapt and they are seen to be overly obstructive, then uh, once there is going to be a referendum uh, on the N MPP, there is also going to be uh, uh, perhaps maybe some judgment call similar to what we saw in 2020. Because what Ghanaians said in 2020 was that we don't trust the N MPP enough to give them a majority, but we don't also trust the NDC enough you know, to overturn the majority uh, that the MPP had in the, in the previous parliament. So if we are not careful, we might end up in a situation where whilst the MPP is not trusted, uh, the NDC is also not going to be too much trusted, and then we end up in another stalemate going into the ninth parliament. The eighth parliament has begun its second session. Both the NDC and NPP are in court challenging the outcome of some of the parliamentary results, including Asin North, Techiman South, Jomoro constituency, among others. Outcome of these court processes will tilt the numbers in the House. Ransford Jampo is warning of the possible disturbances 
should the outcome of these court processes favor the governing MPP? As a student of politics and as somebody who believes in law, rule of law, I would agree with you that if at the end of the day something untoward happened and a judgment will have to come to alter the numbers, I mean, that will be the due process to follow. But sometimes the court must be mindful of the implication of its ruling on the entire society and its peace. So if you think about it, if a ruling comes and it alters the numbers, will it bring about peace? Do you think that all others will sit down and say, well, um, that is the ruling and so we're hang parliament now, we've been shortened by two or more people and so let's accept it like that. If we'll be able to contain that, so be it. But if that is likely to disturb, disturb our peace and to destabilize as a nation, then the courts, they are, not, they are not headed by people who are robots. They are judges who also think about what is going on outside the confines of the courts. The country will this year mark the 30th anniversary of the Fourth Republic. The fears of many Ghanaians, including Occupy Ghana, is that the conduct of the NPs in the chamber threatens the country's democracy. But it remains to be seen whether the NPs will share their differences and work in harmony to preserve the country's democracy. But there is one thing that is certain, that when illegality becomes a norm, resistance become a duty for joy news quisi paka wilson